Welcome to Breaking Down Bits, a conversation about great comedy bits with the comedians who wrote and performed them. Welcome to Breaking Down Bits. I'm Brian Gendron. I'm Drew Jordan. And man, we are really rocking through season two. Um, just coming off a wonderful interview with John Caparulo last week. Uh, what a great get. I am so shocked and, and just thankful that he took some time to hang out with us and share and share a little bit of his, his comic journey and his writing style. That was a wonderful chat with him. If you missed it, it's, of course, on all podcast platforms. You can get to that at BreakingDownBits.com. Absolutely. Before we get into callbacks with John, we also had a great open mic. So we've been running our, our op online open mic feedback mic, and it's been great. We had some good comics. Another first timer, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. So uh, thanks for everybody who's participated in that. If you are interested in joining one of our mics, we run it most mm -hmm. Tuesdays. Uh, you can get us at BreakingDownBits at gmail.com. Email us anytime. And we'll, we'll make sure we get you on a list. Absolutely. So what, what do you got for your callback for John Caparulo, Brian? Oh, so much great stuff. But one thing that I put to action this week and when I was on stage was he talked about having just have one punchline and then build around it. Now, he's a little bit more experienced than me, so he's he feels more free to write on stage. And that, that's that's part of his process. I, I allow myself a little bit of room, but putting out that punchline, making sure that the that that hits and then building it from there has been something I've been doing. So I've been slowly adding tags and working backwards as opposed to what I used to do, which is trying to tell a longer story and then find the nuggets within the story. I've mm -hmm. flipped that and it's a little bit more comfortable and uh, it's better for audiences, I think. Yeah, I like the way I, I think um, it gives you that confidence to know you have the big punchline waiting. So you have the freedom to kind of do some some fun stuff before you get there. Um, for me, I think the callback, you know what I think I'm going to go with the fact that he's trying some different stuff right now. The, um, the cartoon comic he's, he's creating, uh, these little, uh, I guess animated digital shorts. He's working on a comic book. He's finding other ways to share his comedy, some new places to dig in. I love that because, um, in all this pandemic, I've been digging into YouTube and I'm working to release a new YouTube series here coming soon. And it's been a wonderful project. I've enjoyed kind of branching out from just stand up comedy and trying to like see where I can fit my comedy into different places. And maybe maybe that's something for for others as well. Don't just be, you know, especially in this pandemic, don't be tied down to just stand up. Um, keep, keep an open mind to other platforms and other, other ways to share your comedy. Yeah. I mean, as comics, naturally we're creative. So put that to work, you know, and, and John, like you mentioned, has done a terrific job of doing that with this cartoon, uh, get on YouTube, do sketches, whatever you can do to make sure that you're still writing, still staying sharp, mm -hmm. still giving the world your comedy. Cause it's, yep. uh, if you're working hard at it, it's worth sharing. All right, you, you ready to bring in our guest? Let's do it. Ian Lara is one of the hottest rising comics in New York City. He was the host of Out of Tune, the music app game show. You've seen him on Comedy Central stand-up featuring NBC's Bring the Funny, and he made his late-night debut on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. He was a regular player on This Week at the Comedy Cellar on Comedy Central, and you can catch his special L.A. Meets New York streaming on all HBO platforms. Ian Lara, how are you, sir? Oh, you guys read my bio. Nice. <laughs> I, totally. I read it out loud into a microphone. Totally. <laughs> you know what's funny? I, I sometimes like I, I, you know, when you're like starting off, you go so long without anything happening that like you, you forget to update. And I remember I used to do colleges and stuff and I would. Like I would never, t they wouldn't ask me like, oh, how do you want to be introduced? I'll just be like, say whatever you want. It's fine. <laughs> it doesn't matter at all. And students will go up there and literally read off my bio. And I'm like, well, it's some of it's supposed to be a joke. You know, when you write your bio, some of it, it's like supposed to be in a joking tone and they would yeah. say it all serious. And I'm like, this, this is <laughs> I got to delete my website. <laughs> we run into that quite a bit because that's where obviously where Drew gets all these bios. And, and a lot of comics don't necessarily update their bios all the time. Right. But one thing I definitely wanted to call out is that you just on Friday released a, a new special on HBO Max. Tell us about it. 
Yeah, it's a yeah, it's a short special. It's a thirty minute uh, quick special. I split it with um, another great comedian, Chris Estrada. We both do fifteen minutes, and uh, it's it's dope. It's 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 quick. It's still, you know, we still filmed it like I, we filmed it in a theater. It was cool. It was fun. And um, I'm very happy with it. Excellent. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's well, on you, HBO Max and HBO On Demand, whatever, however you watch your HBO stuff. So we like to dive in. You're obviously doing national TV. You're on HBO. So uh, one of the things we really like to start with is, is talking about your early breaks. Uh, so it, as you walk us through kind of your background, uh, uh, tell us tell us your story. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm I'm from I was born born and uh, raised in Queens, New York. So I had one of the, that was an advantage that I was born in the stand up capital of the world. I didn't have to move anywhere. I pretty much started comedy as soon as I finished college. I had moved back home, and I started like a week later. I just started going out to open mics and. I, uh, I I wasn't I mean, I'm, I've only been doing it eight years and a half, but I always consider myself. I wasn't one of those um, guys who I remember that when I first started, there were people who like immediately within like two years, they were doing stuff that was like that. I'm like, like, this is insane. I kind of had a slow build like my first two years. I didn't even do real shows like I just did open mics. Um, and not because I couldn't like I would get booked on on shows here and there and I would do them. But that wasn't my focus. Like my focus was literally just open mics. Like I wanted to get to a point where I was comfortable. And that once once I was comfortable at the open mics, I put my focus in getting on shows. Then I moved on to doing like, you know, these produced shows all around the city. Then it came a point where I was doing half produced half open mics. And I was like, you know what? I, I have to get out of the open mics. I just felt like I was done. Cause I was the guy that would show up to the open mic. Uh, I, like they always would put me on early, like at, at the open mics I used to go to, because I was always kind of like one of those guys that did jokes. Like, so it would kind of get the open mic going. Even if I bombed, it was like very jokey. So they were like, all right, people know what's going on. So I would go up first and then stay the whole time. So I would be like two hours. I was like, I would go to two, three open mics and spend like four or five hours at open mics in the night. So you get like, I was done. I mean, in my early 20s, it was fine. But by the time I was like 25, I was just done. I was like, I have to get out of the open mics. Then I set my focus on getting into the clubs. And, you know, that was a slow step. One of the first clubs that I got into was uh, the Stan Comedy Club in, uh, in, in New York, which was one of the A clubs. I was lucky enough to be able to, they allowed me to host and gave me spots here and there. Um, and then I, you know, then once I got into that club, then the next step was like, I got to get into another club. Then I got into Broadway Comedy Club and mm. they were great. They were instrumental to me because they gave me so many spots. And they, they, they like, like I, I first started like doing late night spots there, but like I worked my way up and they had gave me basically the keys to the club. Like I was doing when I was th- I was doing, you know, as much spots as I could you know, every night and, and they would sell out like on a weekend, they're in the middle of Times Square. So they would sell out, get like 300, they have two rooms, they'll get 300 people in one room, hundred people in another room. I could do three spots there up, you know, go up and down. So that allowed me to grow, you know, once I was into a couple clubs and I, I started my focus switched, like, I feel like every two years, that's when like your focus, like thing, my focus switched to, I was like, all right, like now I'm working the clubs, I'm doing some colleges on the road, I'm doing some clubs on the road. I have to I want to get credits. You know, people ask me, how do I bring you up? Because I had I, I, I was lucky enough to meet an agent. I met uh, Roger Paul in New York City when I was like two or three years in because I used to host uh, a bringer show that they used to do at the um, stand. So you get to meet a lot of industry people there. So I met him and he allowed me to go on the road pretty early. So I was going on the road at like three, four years in. And even on those clubs, like I built there was road clubs where I went from, you know, uh, like host, feature, and headline. So there was clubs that would allow me to headline without me having any credits. They would literally just allow me to headline off the strength that I hosted, did well, featured, did well. And they were like, all right, come headline on a dead weekend, you know? Like, so I had clubs that I was already headlining. And my goal was I just wanted to have credits. Like, I just thought, like, when the host asked me, like, hey, how do you want to, you know, you're headlining a show and the host is like, oh, how do you want to be brought up? And I'm like, yeah, say what I read my bio like Drew, <laughs> I'm like say whatever you like you know I, that that was thing and then I remember my uh my late manager I had to, I have two Chris and Dave uh Dave uh passed away last year but I remember he told me because I was you know young comic you get like very like what, what is it like what is it about me like I'm doing the work I'm writing I'm on stage like what is it why doesn't the industry like me like I'm fairly clean like I'm not this you know dirty or or blue comedian like why doesn't the industry like me? And I remember he always used to tell me, um, you got to just uh, you got to be patient. Like when it when things break, like in this industry, when things break, it's like a domino effect. Like sometimes getting the first thing is tough. But when things break, 
you know, things start to to trickle down. The first thing I got, the first break I got was for Comedy Central. I did I did uh, Comedy Central stand up featuring, which at that point, nobody knew what it was going to be. I did the first season like they literally reached out to my manager like, hey, we have this idea for this show. We feel like everything is going into, you know, streaming and online. So they were like, we have this idea for the show. Um, it's not going to air on Comedy Central, but we're really going to push it on YouTube, Facebook and in the Comedy Central app. We're really going to push this to the forefront. And then he was like, hey, do you want to do this? I was like, yeah, I have no credits. I want to do it for sure. And I had nothing else on the horizon. And I remember taping that. I remember we taped that September 11, 2018, actually on my birthday. And I remember being backstage talking to the other comics. And like a lot of comics were like, like I said, because they didn't know what this was going to be. They were like, well, I have my set, but I don't want to do my set my good set, you know, my A stuff, because I want to do this on a tonight show. I want to do this on Conan or I want to do this on something that's, that's, you know, big. I had no type of like, I, I couldn't even see that in the horizon at the time. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to try to do my good jokes. Like, you know, I'm going to try to do my, my, my real jokes, let it be out there. Worst case scenario, I'll take clips of it and post it up on my Instagram and I'll have these cool clips from comedy central, you know? Yeah. So we filmed that in September. Long story short, my set came, comes out in January. Comedy Central like pushes it like 100 percent, like more than they push their TV stuff. And, and my my set that I did for them ended up going like viral has has over like 10 million views on my first set that I did for them, which was insane. And that was the first time where I started going on the road and doing stuff here in the city where I would go to shows and like one or two people in the audience knew who I was because they had seen the clip because it got shared uh, so much. They were just like, like, that was insane to me. You go from like being an open mic to like people at a show like, hey, we know you like you like I love your clip. Like, I love your jokes. So now that like that, that puts you um, into like a different level. That was like the first like, you know, quote unquote break that I had. But the big break, obviously, um, for me was The Tonight Show. And yeah. that came uh, again, through my ma my manager, uh, David and Chris, they had pushed me to the Tonight Show Booker. They were pushing me for a long time because, like I said, a lot of my jokes are clean and I don't curse. You know, I curse. If you see me performing around town, like I might curse. But like once it's time for showtime, I try to clean it up, take the curses out just because I feel like I, if I, I I'm not like opposed to it. But I, if, if I could get away with not using them, I would not I won't use them, you know, just because yeah. it's kind of like a challenge to me as a writer. Like if you could like still get the joke to work without curses. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes like this joke is funnier with a fucking, so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to say it. The, but, uh, your tonight show clip, I think we showed it at the top. You, I have the same tie, man. It's a good tie. So we, oh, we got to get the man. same taste. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, uh, the, the other thing I'll say is Tom Takar came on a couple episodes ago and he had basically told the same story about that comedy central. Gig. Was on so, yeah. 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 Tom, Tom was on my show too. Um, yeah, he actually, I remember he had a great set. He went up first too. And I, I went up last. I remember that was like a, like a thing. Cause I, I, at that point, at that point, like I had nothing, I had done nothing. Comedy Central had seen me showcase a couple of times, but I had done nothing. And we, when I got there, like on my show, like every other comic that I've taped with worked for Comedy Central, like in some capacity, like they either hosted a podcast, they hosted a show, they were Comedy Central guys. And at that point I wasn't. So when I like got there and I saw the lineup, I'm like, why am I last? Like, why am I last? <laughs> You know, and I and I, I I wasn't like complaining. I was like, whatever, I'll go up whenever I want. But it was like seven comics. And I was, uh, you know, and, and I was the last one. You and, get secure, man. You know, that's what happens when you have, you know, people yeah. credits in front of you. And then you, you got to do your right. bits. I'm like, I'm not right. as good as these guys. It's just you right. get in your own right. head. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, for me, I knew that I knew I, I knew the guy. I knew the people. So I knew what mm -hmm. they did. You know, they did. And they were all super talented. But I, I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to get blown off the stage. You know, I was like, I, I, I thought I could hang. But I was just like, why not? Like, these are your guys, right? These are the guys yeah. you guys believe in a lot. So why not put... And I ended up asking Comedy Central that when I met with them, like, a couple... Like, a year later, I asked. I was like, why was I put last in a show that, you know, had all your guys. And they were just like, oh, because we seen your stand up and we thought that you would do well at that point. There was other people where we thought we, you know, we wanted to put them in a different position, but we thought that wherever you went, you would do um, fine. And it was fine, but that was kind of the things, kind of one of the things that stuck in my head where it's like, and in and, and this business, a lot of the stuff that's like complimentary, sometimes you take it as like, what, what is it, like, you don't like me? Like, what, <laughs> like am I, you know, like what's wrong with me? But, but some, sometimes it's intended to be complimentary. You know, it's not intended to be like, 
like um, a diss or whatever. But yeah, my Tonight Show was Dave, Dave and Chris had introduced, had brought me up to the Booker for like, since like 2017, 2016, they had, they started like pushing me to the Booker. And he's like a great, great dude, uh, Michael Cox, great dude. And he had seen me uh, showcase, he invited me to showcase. Well, he had seen me a few times at the stand up for diversity thing. He was one of the guys and he, uh, he, he enjoyed me. He, 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 he always showed me love, but it's one of those things where like, you know, in this business, people see you and they'll be like, Oh, you're great. But like, you know, two, three years, let you know, we want, we want to give you time to develop. And at the, at the time you're like, damn, like, why can't I do it now? But looking back, you're like, Oh, thank God. Thank you for not putting me on TV at that time because I would have had a set that I'm <laughs> not proud of and, and, and begging you to take it down so people can't see it. So like, um, sometimes bookers seem like they don't know what they're doing, but they, they do a lot of the good ones do the good ones understand, especially when they tell you like, Oh, we like you, but let's, let's, you know, let's let you develop a little bit. But um, th this was in 2017. Um, I had another like big influential person in my career has been Mark uh, Norman. Uh, Mark Norman has helped me. He's helped me so much. He's helped me almost in everything that I've done. Cause uh, at any time, like anytime they ask Mark, like, um, you know, who, who are like, you know, young comics that you enjoy that you I should look out for. He, he always mentions my name and same thing when the tonight show reached out to him and asked him like, who were the, who were a couple names of young comics to think Mark really gave the booker my name. And he was like, Ian, you gotta, you know, you gotta check out Ian. He's great. Uh, Mark took me out to, to on the road with him. Uh, we, we, we did, we do a bunch of road. We took, Still till now, we still do road stuff together. Um, he has helped me so much. So he 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 pushed me. And when somebody like it's one thing when like a manager tells a booker, you know, watch my like look out for my clients. Like, yeah, every manager is telling a booker to look out for their client. But when somebody like Mark Norman, who's like such a joke guy and arguably the late night king or one of them, you know, nobody has more fucking excellent sets than Mark. Uh, when he gives a booker your name, it's like, OK, I need to watch this kid. I need to, you know, I need to uh, really, really pay attention to this kid. And I was I remember I was out in Los Angeles. I was uh, I was doing I forgot what I was doing. I think I was actually I was actually meeting with HBO in Los Angeles to do to do what just came out. This was like in 2019. <clears throat> and I got an email. I remember I was at the at the waffle. I was at the um at Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles. And I'm just, I'm just sitting there by myself, having my coffee, eating um, whatever. And I get an uh, email from the manager, from the booker of The Tonight Show. He's like, hey, man, it's uh, Michael Cox. Uh, we're looking for, for comics for the for next January. This is September. He's like, we're looking for comics for January. If you have a set that you, you want to submit, he's like, I'm looking for sets. Your name has been mentioned a, a bunch of times. I'll be happy to look at your set. So if you have it, send it over. We'll check it out. I'll get back to you. I looked at the email. I was like, all right, cool. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't think too much of it because I had been rejected already so many times. So I was like, all right, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll get a set together and I'll do it. You know, I remember I was, uh, so I was in LA, I was flying back to New York and I flight back to New York and in, in LA, I took like an early flight. And I remember I was on a plane and I was like, let me like go through my jokes, have my like joke list. I'm like, let me go through my jokes. Let me try to set up a set that I think would work um, for the tonight show. And I had watched like every tonight show set on, on YouTube, like every Jimmy Fallon set and even going back to the old days. So my mind, I felt like my mind already knew like what they allowed and what they didn't like subconsciously. I already knew, like, I felt like I could have been a booker and be like, they'll allow that. They won't allow that. <laughs> they'll allow that. They won't allow that. So I wrote up the set. I remember I landed in New York. I called the booker of Broadway comedy club. I was like, Hey, uh, you know, they, I, I got to submit a tape for the Tonight Show. If you have five minutes, let me know. I'll come by. I would love to do it. He was like, oh, yeah, come by today. If you're free, come by today. We have a show at six. Come by today. I was like, all right, I'll come. I'll come by. Um, I, I landed. I went home. I changed. I went to Broadway that day. I got on stage. I recorded it the, the five minutes and I got on stage and he was like, how do you feel? I was like, I think that's it. <laughs> I, think I, <laughs> I was like, I think I got the set. That was it was this early crowd Saturday night in New York. It's like a hot crowd. And this was like a, it, it was kind of like a new comic show. So it's like you get like a seasoned comic on, you can really pop, you know, cause it's like, you know, it's, you know how that works. And, um, and yeah, I submitted it. 
Yeah, I submitted this like in October because I had sent out the set to like a couple people to check it out. I sent it to Mark. Hey, Mark, what do you think? I sent it to like a producer I knew at NBC who was friends with the HBO. I was like, what do you think? I sent it to my manager. What do you think? What do you think? And everyone, you know, uh, they gave me certain notes like, hey, we, it's great, but this might not work. That might not work. Um, they might not allow this. They might not allow that. And I was like, no, no, I've seen every set. <laughs> you know, those jokes will get in. Like, I promise you. If they give it to me, they'll allow those jokes. And I submitted it. I didn't hear nothing back. I submitted it like mid-October. I didn't hear nothing back. Uh, I, I actually heard back in the middle of October. I got an email from from Michael. He was like, uh, he's like, hey, man, I'm working on another show right now. I got your set. I'm going to watch it. I'm just a little busy right now. I'll get back to you. It's like mid-October. Then, uh, then I remember sitting at home on Halloween. I got an email. I got another email from Michael Cox. Pops on my phone, Michael Cox. I'm like, all right. See what this I think he's like as a rejection. I open the email. He's like, Hey man, just watch this set. This is amazing. Can you do this? He's like, Can you do this November 14th? This is on Halloween. This is like two weeks. So he's like, Could you do I, I was supposed to do it in January? He's like, We just had a dropout. Could you do this in two weeks? I was like, Yeah, I could do it in two weeks. <laughs> and he was like, Great. I'm gonna send it to um uh, standards and practices. Let's see if it gets approved. Uh he sent it in. Uh everything got approved as I thought I would, and he was like all right, start running the set. This is it. I have no notes. You could do it exactly how you how you came up with it. And that was like my Tonight Show experience. And that was like the that was like the thing that I was like, OK, I'm a comic now. You know, shortly after that, I got into the comedy cellar and, and started, you know, I was like, OK, now I'm like, I'm, I, I can put comedian on my tax returns. Yeah. What a, so a lot of a lot of people who listen to this podcast are definitely in the beginning stages, maybe the first couple of years of doing comedy. You know, obviously you had clearly some amazing connections, um, some, some manager stuff that popped in. What advice would you give to someone who's a year or two in, what do they need to be looking for to go from that open micer, uh, into the clubs or taking those next, next steps? What's, what's the most important couple of things they can be thinking about? Man, I feel like, I feel like at least in my experience, it's, it's like, it's a lot simpler than people think. It's really it really comes down to just always bring it, man, like just always. And that bringing it does not mean killing. Bringing it does not mean always killing. Nobody is always killing. Everyone has their rough sets. But if you ask anybody who knew me from like day one, I always tried to do well. Like trying to do well is like 90 percent of the battle. Like just try to do well, like even when it doesn't go well. Other comics see that and they respect it. Like everything I've gotten from my manager to my introduction to the bookers, it's all been through other comics who seen me and they respected it. And they didn't see me at some big showcase. They saw me at some piece of shit show where shit wasn't going well. And they were like, oh, he's trying. He's bringing it. This kid wants, you know, I feel like when you put when you work hard at something if you put your best foot forward a lot of times the universe just aligns in ways like people just want to help you people just want to attach themselves to things where they feel has a future so like i mean i even even like before the pandemic like i would go by you know you're working on new bits you stop by an open mic to run out the new bits and i see some of like and i'll watch like some of the young young younger new guys and i'm just like man, like, why are you guys like you, you go on stage and you're just like have nothing to talk about. You haven't written any jokes like and that's not to say that I was writing new jokes every single day. But if you haven't written any new jokes, then do the work on the old stuff that, you know, don't don't say the, these jokes work so I don't have to do it because you never know who's in the audience. I got my manager through Adrian Appalucci. She introduced me to my management team. Great, funny, funny comics. One of my good friends from New York. And she saw me performing at some fundraiser i was hosting some fundraiser in uh my my like i was like two and a half years in three years in. i was hosting some fundraiser for a friend for like a teacher's union and again like i was just trying to do well like i'm 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 trying i'm always trying to do well i feel like that's like the most important thing like don't mail it in like don't think because uh you know a lot i think a lot of comics because we're such cynics we'll tell ourselves like I'm not going to try. So if I don't try and I bomb, I can say I didn't try. Yeah. And it's like, it's, uh, it's, and it's not real. You know, I'll be like, oh, I was just, I was just doing new stuff. These jokes aren't worked out. And it's like, yeah. all right, you didn't even write, you didn't even bother to write the joke. You just kind of had a premise that was kind of funny. And then you took it on stage as if you're Bill Burr and could just, 
you know, <laughs> as if you could just come up with this great bit on stage. You don't get the quality stage time Bill Burr does, ha, has to be able to do that. As a person who's like now been able to like get those quality stage time, it's more possible to do to go on stage and create a bit at the comedy cellar than it is at an open mic. Like the comedy cellar, everybody's phone is zipped up away. Everyone is there to see comedy and everyone, you know, it's it's a show where they're paying attention to you and they're with you 100 percent. So you can you can develop stuff there if you're if you have that skill. But like at an open mic, just taking up an idea, I feel like like. No, no disrespect to anyone, but like we're not there. Like we're young comics trying to make it. Like you got to do the work. Like I yeah, don't know. There's a lot of these bar, a lot of these open mics, of course, that we go to in here in Houston are our bar shows. Yeah. And and half the people are paying attention, half the people aren't. And yeah. so like you're battling for attention. Like you're not even trying to make them like stick with you for a bit. You're just trying to get eyeballs and right. ears. Like yeah. period. Yeah. I mean, I've done, I do hear the same thing here. I mean, he, here, one thing I, I find about like other cities is some other cities, sometimes you go to open mic and the open mic is like great. Sometimes the show uh, here in New York, a lot of times they're like that too. They're, they're like that. But even if, even when that happens to me, still happens to me till now, especially now because all shows are outdoors. So now you're competing with everything. Imagine outdoor show in New York city, you're competing with the homeless, you're competing with the garbage trucks, fire department, there's construction, there's a you know guy uh you know guy yelling out anti-racist shit on the corner it's like that's just it you compare it but i always just try to bring it like even yeah. though it, it even though like i'm you know i i'm i'm human and i'm like what the like nobody's paying attention nobody's listening to me but i'm not trying to like torpedo the show i'm just trying to tell yeah. my jokes and i find that in my short eight and a half years of doing this comedians really respect that I know that the other day, and I will we'll shout out a local guy who I love. His name is Will Loden. Uh, he's from Memphis, moved to Houston. And the other night, it was a couple of months back, yeah. we went to this uh, mic. And man, it, the, the crowd kind of emptied. And yeah. by, by the time he was going on at this mic, literally, um, it was just comics there. It was two or three of yeah. us. And he did his set as if he was on a Comedy Central special. He brought a hundred percent of his energy, a hundred percent of his best material. Had fun with it. Yeah. Was a, he could tell he was enjoying it. He right. was doing it for like three or four of us, and I was like, "Man, yeah. that, you, I, re you, I respect." You remember him? You see how like you you yeah. like the story that you have. Uh, now imagine if you're a comic that does that at every mic, every show you perform at, every yeah. time you leave, there's somebody that's gonna have the story like how you have of him. Eventually, you do that yeah. enough. Eventually you know, sting, things start rolling. Like, yeah, for sure. The, one of the blessings of the pandemic that I've found is that, you know, we were, Drew, probably, or, and probably you, Ian, we were doing seven, 10 mics a week and we just were just going through the motions, you know what I mean? And then we get booked yeah. on a showcase and we weren't really trying new material. Now we still can do mics in Houston, but now it's like two or three. So you cherish every second of stage time that you can get and you got to try out new jokes uh, and you practice them on the way you put the effort in like you're talking about. So that has really been a, a, a silver lining in the nonsense of the of the pandemic and what it's done to comedy is that yeah. you, you don't take this shit for granted anymore. For sure. And I'm all for I'm all for like do new jokes, write new jokes. But the, but it's like you said, but like do the work, though. Like yeah. new jokes, doing new jokes, 95% of it is the work you do at home or at the coffee shop when you're writing it. You, you, everyone has funny ideas, but this, I don't know, like this notion of like new young comics uh, taking their funny ideas and just trying to like <laughs> kind of wing it. It's like, it's tough because it's like, we, we don't have that muscle yet. I myself don't have that muscle yet. I mean, I, I've seen some people who are, who are, I'm younger in the game than me who can do it a little bit better. But even if you could do it great, even if you do it great, think about how much better that joke would be if you sat down and actually gave it a time of, you know, some time of day to like develop. I feel like that's like a very important aspect of it that most people don't consider. Yeah. We, we are all not Bill Burr and Dave Chappelle. Uh, <laughs> that is not how right. we're not, we're not that place yet. And but even yeah. Chappelle, I've, I've seen Chappelle. I saw Chappelle uh, a couple of weeks ago. He had with a notebook, like he was reading, yeah jokes off a notebook that he wrote like he, yeah. he's not just you know even he he's at home with the pen put in yeah. put in work and burr said that he didn't start writing on stage till he was like 25 years in i've heard him say that yeah like, i don't i'm not a i'm not in a place where i do a lot of writing on stage sometimes there's a fun tag or something tag, yeah. that works yeah but um yeah I, I know for sure that 
it changes my confidence level a hundred percent. If I know I'm coming in with jokes that I'm proud of and right. jokes that I have worked on and edited and, and, and kind of like, you know, twisted yeah. around till I made it like better than it was just a, just a flash of an idea. I've now worked this thing out and it's stronger now and it's going to, it's yeah. got some legs at this point, which is a great transition to talking about your your writing style. We we like to ask comics very open ended question. Take it wherever you want. Uh, how does uh, Ian Laura write comedy? Yeah, I'm. Um, I, I I sit down when I'm like again. I, I you know sometimes I remember being a young comic. You listen to comics like for example like Seinfeld. He's like I wrote every single day for twenty four hours a day. <laughs> I, I, used to, I used to take a shower and then and then you're like, am I not work? Like should I be? <laughs> should I quit living life and just start writing every single day? So I'm definitely not. I'm definitely not that. Like I'm definitely not that. But I do get into like writing mode. Like how there's there's artists. Or, or singers who who they get into album mode where they're like just every day all of their energy is going into like creating the new album like that's how I get like right now I'm in writing mode like I'll wait like if every day this week I've been waking up um, especially now you know most people are just home doing not doing much especially if you're just a comic um, I've been getting up I'll write three, four hours a day. Like I'll spend basically all afternoon sitting on my couch writing. And again, writing, I have my computer. I have a Evernote on my computer. So I write it on my computer. Then it goes to um, Evernote. I actually have my uh, notebook here. I got my my uh, leather bound comedy notebook. Nice. Uh, this is this is the notebook. I keep this more as like a, a archive, like in case. Yeah in case the computer crashes and you know, I want to keep track of the jokes that I have. I keep it on my, on my, um, I'll, I'll write it here. So I, I, I usually won't put the joke in here until like the, until like the, I feel like it's a joke already, you mm -hmm. know, like Evernote has like a bunch of ideas, a bunch of premises. And I have that on Evernote and I have on my phone and I'll, and I, and I'll keep it here. Um, I don't know if you can see, like, I don't know if you see, but it, I, I keep it color. It's highlighted like, um, in, in, let me find a page. I, I use two highlighters. I use uh, the a pink one that highlights like a bit that's like a old bit that I've already that that I've done that's done. And then I have a I use orange for like new bits, like new bits. I'll color code it in orange just so when I'm when I'm looking, I see. And sometimes I'll rewrite a joke, and if I change something to it, an old joke, I'll put it in orange because now it's like new again. Um, but yeah, but this I don't I don't bring this out too much. I use this like like again to archive. Most of it stays on um, on my Evernote, and then I ha and then I use this notebook. Well, it's not really a notebook, but I use this pad, this uh this index card pad to like like look. These are like all like I'll just write the the title of the bits. These are like new bits that I'm working on. It's like Comedy Castle, Find a Vaccine. You know, like these are all my new bits. So sometimes I'll have this on, I'll take this on stage, especially now because we're not really doing club shows. So it's like outdoor shows. It's like whatever. So I'll, I'll take this on stage just so I know like all the new stuff that I'm doing that I want to do. And uh, if, if this is like what I take show to show. Cause I, I find it weird to be on your phone. Like, do, like when you're on stage, scrolling through your phone always looks weird. I think it's always like kind of, old school to just have like a pad and it looks more like, Oh, he wrote this, you know, like <laughs> you're reading it off your phone. So, is this, is this guy just reading memes right now? What is he? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> this is, this is like, wow, shit, he has a pen. Oh my God. <laughs> this so yeah, that's it. The, so I'll just get an idea. I, I, I usually like, I don't just, I don't just get an idea and start writing in it. Like I'll get an idea. I'll sit with it for like a little while um, see if uh, if I still believe in it. And if I really, you know, if it stays with me for like, I'll write it down. If it stays with me for like a little while, then I'll be like, all right, I have to sit down and 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 try to figure this out. And and mm -hmm. and what you mentioned with uh, Caparulo, um, I, I use that mentality completely. I kind of reverse engineer my jokes where like I'll have I'll, I'll get the punchline usually first. And if and I'll do the punchline, like just kind of like however I wrote the joke, I'll just do the punchline. And if it's a big if it gets a big laugh or, or a decent laugh, then I try to reverse engineer it and I tighten up the setup and the premise and the, and the punchline sometimes stays the same. And I just tighten up the premise and the thing and then I'll add tags to it like that. I noticed you're actually, and I, and I forgive me on the clip that we have, I kind of cut off a little bit of your setup, but you have a very conversational like setup type style. So yeah. it might it might be a little bit before you get to that first punch, but you make it worth it. And and I really I really appreciate that that style that you have. 
Yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you. Um, yeah, I try to keep it, I, you know, every, co every comedian, like that's one of the, that's one of like the things that's what you do when you start, you're trying to like find what it is about you. How do you work? You know, like I've seen some other, you, we've all seen like the, the white nerdy comic who's like, his thing is like to be like nerdy. Like that's who he is off stage. He kind of am, um, amplifies it on stage and it works great. Like it's like, it, it works great. And the jokes fit into like his persona of like being the nervous, anxious guy or like the, you know, the weird guy, like, I've seen that persona and I love it. Like it makes me laugh so much when I see it, especially when you see that the jokes match up with who the person is. I feel like that's like the best thing. But like for me, sometimes I'm like, damn, sometimes I write jokes where I'm like, I would want to, I want to give this to one of them because this joke wouldn't work for me. Cause I like what I, that's not my persona. You know, it's not going to be believable if I, if I try to pretend, if I go on stage and I'm like, yeah. you, you know, like I, I'm, I'm like wearing like new Jordans and stuff and like clothes. I can't just be like, Oh, you know, I, I, I can't get girls. Like that's not, <laughs> even, like, even if like, if, even if I don't get them, like, I feel like the audience will have a hard time believing like like they'll be like but you you're dressed fine like what well, you know like it'll be a tough sell to mm -hmm. be like oh i can't meet people they're like but you look social and so, so my my th I, i've learned that my thing is that like i make it feel like we're having a conversation on stage and and that allows me to like kind of hide the punchline kind of like a a running back protecting the football yeah or like always trying to be like are we talking or like where's this you know like <laughs> like they're trying to figure it out because i'm just kind of speaking and I, it allows me to run through like hiding the football and 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 allows me then i score they're like what, the, what we would you know we didn't even see that you had the football so that that's like my thing so when i'm right i i, I try to make be cognizant of that like of of keep it keep it conversational even though i i still do consider myself like a punchline comic and i am very set up punch i think mm -hmm. yeah what about when it comes to say one other question we like to get into is how do you prepare for a set say you have a, a, sh a big show coming up or you know we got into a little bit of your um uh late night prep but what do you do when you have a set coming up is there something any special preparation that you kind of go through before um, do you make a set list? Like what, what sort of things are you doing before you, uh, maybe a couple days or a week before the show? Um, I don't do too much. I don't do too much of a, any, anything special. Like I like to write it out, like write out the set that helps me. That allows me to memorize it better. Like the set exactly how you want to go. I, I write it out and, um, I don't like the way I'll learn like a long set, like, it's like, I don't learn the full set. Like, I just know what joke goes after this joke. You know, like I, I just put I just remember like, all right, after the dating joke comes this joke. When you finish this joke, just always know when you finish this joke, you go into the family stuff. When the family stuff finished. So that's kind of like how I write it out. And I'll just like keep reminding myself of that. So it allows you, you stick to that in your shows. I know a lot of comics say they make set lists and then just never really stick to it. Do you really stick to it most of the time? If it's a, like if it's like a taping, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to stick to it because these are the jokes that I want to put out there. So I'm going to stick to it in a taping. But in in like a normal show no, not really like now, like again, like now this is all my like new stuff from quarantine. So it's like like you said, I, I was getting up on stage. I was doing 25 to 30 sets a week. Like I was doing three, four sets a night here in New York. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing like that now. If I do if I do 10 sets in a month now, it's a lot. So yeah. uh, stuff. Bummer. All this stuff, yeah, like this stuff, I came, I started with it in probably mid-July, but I still consider all of it new because I haven't been able to run it how I usually like to run it. Like, I'm a person where I like to run the jokes at every room. Like, I like to take it to all the clubs in New York. As you go down the island in New York, you get different audiences at different clubs. I like to run it through all of them. So all this stuff is like, and it's expanding, it's getting bigger. It started with like three, four minutes. I'm up to like 15. Now I'm expanding, adding stuff. But again, I'm not going to be able to like get it to where I want to get it until I'm going out every night and doing them. Sure. Let, let's talk about the moments before you step on stage. You have any sort of uh, traditions or things that you do right before you get on stage? Uh, not really. Not really. I, I kind of, I kind of just, if, if I'm doing new, obviously I kind of just look look over the new, like, make sure I don't forget a joke. As comics, we always forget the new, no matter what. Like, yesterday, like last night I did a show and I have it written out and I'm looking at the note on stage and I still forgot, <laughs> I still forgot the joke. <laughs> I got to I got a highlight, like I got to highlight the new one, like the real, because I, I have like two completely new ones that I wanted to do and I completely forgot them. Looking at it, still, still forgot them. I got to remember the highlight, but I, I, I try not to, I try not to get, I try not to get too in my head about it. Like I try to, not, yeah. you know, t not because, again, like my thing is like when I get on stage, I have to 
I have like my whole thing is to make people feel like we're friends. Like we're not like I kind of don't even want them to feel even though I'm performing and I am putting on a show. I don't want them to feel like it's a show. I want them to feel like I'm kind of just their friend. That's mm -hmm. like telling them a story or talking to them. I'm literally having conversations, but they're not answering me, which yeah. is, you know, which is it's a it's a to, and to be able to do that. You kind of got to. So you gotta gotta be in like a cool place. Like I, I try to keep myself in like a cool place. Yeah. You know? like a, so like in the green room, we've had some comics talk about this. Are you a don't talk to me? I'm preparing, or are you mixing it up to stay in that conversational place before? I'm in know? a I'm in a conversational place. I mean, like a minute before I go on stage, I'm like, all right, let me just remember how I'm starting. So, but like a minute, but like I'm not like when I show up. Like sometimes, you know, I remember hosting or like even feature. You show up and like. Hour and a half before the show, the headliner doesn't want you to talk to them. <laughs> I'm not yeah. like that. Like I'm cool. Like we we're talking right up until you know maybe two three minutes before I go on stage and I look at my notes and go on stage. I try to remain as like casual as I can. Yeah, well, imagine if you're doing fifty uh, sets a week or whatever. Like you're you're pretty in season back in those moments, man. You're just ready. Yeah. You got to be. You're just a warmed up, a, a ready engine, just ready to fire off. Oh yeah, I mean, I you we. You know, looking back at it before before the pandemic, I mean, I, I, I didn't I didn't necessarily take it for granted because I literally worked my entire 20s to get to the point that I was in February where I was working and doing shows every night. And it was like, boom, 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 boom. But at that point, you're just cooking, man. Like I like I, I would run into a club. Hey, and I kind of learned this from Mark because I remember being a young comic seeing Norman do it. Like you just run into a club and you're just like, you're next. You're like, cool, boom, next, doom, doom, doom. Get, get on stage. You're, you're like, take off your jacket. It's cold. It's cold in New York. Take off your coat. Get on stage. Bang, 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 bang. Hit them. Thank you. Get paid. Put on your coat. Uptown. Next club. You're in. You're next. Boom. Do it. You do it <laughs> all around the city. Like you just run in. <laughs> There's no time for preparation. Like you prepare on on your commute to wherever you're going. Once you get there, you know you're late. You got to get on stage right away. I've, I've, if, if you're doing a lot of spots. I've heard Mark talk about the fact that he has a hack and it's a moped. I can picture you like in a sidecar with Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mark does that. I actually, I actually have a car. I have a car like in the city. So I drive. Oh, dang. You said, yeah. So, so that, tickets. Like, my, my preparedness was to be like in the car, like in the car. I'm like, all right. Cause I know when I get there, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm it, it, that feeling. Like I haven't had that feeling since then, since like, since pre-pandemic when I used to be able to just walk into a club. I remember talking to other comics about it. Like, you remember when you used to walk into the club and they'll be like, are you ready? And you're like, yeah, I'm ready. Like, what do you mean? I'm ready. This is what I do. Now, like, you walk into a club, you're like, give me, give me a second. How do I do this? I do the microphone. You gotta, like, <laughs> it's crazy. Listening to sets in the car or no? Between set, between shows? Uh, Not really. I like to kind of re do them in my head. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll think I'm out. I don't, I don't, I record this. Also before the pandemic, that was another thing I used to do. I used to record like a lot of sets. Like I I, I bought like a, gr a good camera that I used to record things like 4k. And I used to record a ton of sets, not to post. I just used to watch them, watch them. Cause I feel like as comedians, especially young comedians, like sometimes, and I don't know if you guys felt this. Sometimes I, I, I feel like I could write a joke better for like, Hannibal Burris than I could for myself. And that's because I'm a Hannibal Burris fan and I've watched him so much that I know how he speaks. I know how he talks. I know his inflections. So I feel like if I wrote a joke, I could say it like Hannibal says it and get a laugh easier than I could myself. And I, I came up with the conclusion that's because I'm always watching Hannibal because I'm a fan. Now you're never watching yourself because you're performing. You don't watch yourself. So I was like, I'm gonna watch myself as much as I watch them, and then I'll be able to perform for myself because I'm saying myself. I don't know if that makes sense, but you're a big yeah. fan of of Ian. Le you're your own biggest fan. That's perfect. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to. You not should be talk. though. I'm yeah, yeah. No, that's but, great. I love. I love that idea just to like watch because I. I think that I some of my best punch up some of the best times that I've switched up a joke and made it a lot better it's just when i'm listening or watching myself and i'm yeah. i'm out of that headspace where i'm not thinking about it being me right i'm yeah. just listening to a funny joke mm -hmm. uh kind of third you know third person and i go oh 
he should have said this. I'm like, oh, that's my joke. I can say that. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, listening, listening definitely helps. It's better than nothing. But watching really, I feel like really helps your performance because you'll be like, why am I holding the mic like that? What's this stupid ass look I got on my face? You know, it helps you. I say that every day into the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's cue up the clip. So tell us a little bit about this this exact day, if you remember it at the the the, the Comedy Central filming at the Comedy Cellar. Any, anything you remember about that specific day? Which clip? Uh, let's, it's what, the, what, it's the red jacket, the red lumberjack. Yeah, 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 yeah. With the hat, with the winter hat. Yep. Yeah. I actually, cause we were, we were taping that show every week. So I, I taped it twice a week for wow. five weeks in a row. So there's a bunch of clips like from the seller show that they put on, but that's the long one that they put on. Um, uh, that, that, yeah, I, I remember that night I had actually just got back again. I had just got back from LA, um, I, I I remember coming down to the cellar and I had a shirt. I had a shirt, a regular shirt that the producers didn't let me wear. They were like, you can't wear that on TV. It was a regular shirt. It was like a Nike shirt, I think. But they were like, you can't wear any brands. So the comedy cellar gave me a shirt. They were like, oh, we have a shirt. For you. <laughs> so I'm wearing a comedy cellar um, shirt. And uh, and yeah, I remember that day. It was just like another regular, a regular filming day. It was right. It was like we filmed that like March like 10th it was right before shutdown like right before you know corona was like really picking up but at that point we was you know nobody knew we were still doing shows still still uh packing them out and i remember uh just doing a set like that set that's out there um i'm very proud of it like it, it's it's and i'm and and the reason i'm i'm so happy with it it's it's only because it captures me doing stand up at a club like that in in like it's not me in like a theater or no like i didn't know they were going to air that i didn't know they were going to put that out there because the way that show works is you go that you get 15 minutes you do old stuff and then you'll do a couple new stuff in for this week at the cellar like they give you the topics you do some new stuff and then they'll air the new stuff and that's it like you you know the old stuff is just kind of to build to so you're not just open mic in it you know yeah. So I did the thing and I did the new stuff and they aired the new stuff on the show, like the new topical stuff. They aired it live. And then a couple months, like uh, two months later, they emailed me. Hey, they're like, hey, we have this set. We like it. We want to put it out there. Do you mind if we put it out there? And at that point, we were like in shutdown. I was like, yeah, I don't know when my next thing is coming. Like, <laughs> burn it. Yeah. Put it up. Worst case scenario. I use all this time. I got to write new jokes, you know. So so they put it out there. And uh, and yeah, I'm 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 really. Uh, I'm really happy with it because it captures me at a club. Every time you tell people like, oh, but you got to see him at a club. You got to see him how he, how he works at a club. You got to see the, the rhythm at a comedy club. It's very different from in a theater and a thing. And that captures it. Cool. Let's yeah. uh, let's run the clip. Oh, boy. Like there's this dude on my block that sells waters. He sells those dollar Poland spring bottles of water. He's been selling waters for like five years. I never bought a water from him. I always kind of just walk right by him. The other day I was walking by. He stopped me. He's like, hey, man, do you live on this block? And I was like, yeah, I live right up the street. And he was like, then you should definitely buy a water from me because I could easily be on your corner selling drugs. I was like, you easily could be selling drugs? Then you should be selling drugs. I was like, this is New York City. You got to have ambition to make it in New York City. I'm like, can't pay your rent with waters. I'm at a good place too. I'm, uh, I'm trying to figure it out right now. I, I just turned 29. I'm 29. Uh, no kids. Not married. Uh, my family thinks right now is the perfect time to start thinking about having a kid because I come from a very traditional family. Like my grandparents, they just celebrated 59 years of being together. Yeah, I know. I know. And they're Hispanic, so they're thinking about getting married. <laughs> My grandmother might be the one, you know? <laughs> I'm 29 with no kids, but to be honest, none of my friends have kids neither. I think millennials just decided we're not gonna have kids. We're like, yeah, society should just end after us. Like it's been, it's, it's been a good run. We're like, this is it. It's been, it's gone on long enough. We'll make up any excuse not to have a kid. You ever spoke to a millennial about having a kid? They get offended. <laughs> they take it as an offense. Starting a family is offensive to them. 
My boy, I was talking to my boy the other day. He was like, Ian, with everything going on today, I don't know if I could bring a baby into this world. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you don't watch the news? This country could go to war at any minute. And I was like, yeah, but things got to get pretty out of hand before they consider sending your baby off to war. <laughs> what exactly are you worried about? And my dad gets mad at me because he was 26 when he had his first kid. I'm 29, no kid, no son having kids. He's like, Ian, you don't get tired of working all day and not having something to come home to? Like, as a man, don't you want something at home waiting for you when you get home a reason to come home after work? And I was like, yeah. So I got Amazon Prime. <laughs> I don't know if y'all know this, but for $125 a year, you could get the same happiness a kid gives you. <laughs> Delivered on your doorstep in 48 hours. That's a good deal. <laughs> and I think I hate when people try to put, especially the older parents, they try to put pressure on you to settle down. I think they forget that day to today is way harder than it was back in the day. I mean, meeting is easier today, but back in the day, you ever stop to think when your parents were dating? You could do whatever you want. <laughs> Nobody would know. <laughs> There's no cell phones with HD cameras to capture everything. You could be married, have another family right across town. Nobody asks no questions. <laughs> it was no proof. Even if you got caught red-handed, somebody happened to have a big-ass camera on them and they took a picture of you, you'd have two weeks before that picture even got developed. <laughs> That's why when older men try to talk to me about dating, I get upset, because I'm like, sir, you don't gotta face the challenges that young men gotta face in modern dating. Like, you never had to video chat with your girlfriend at a funeral because she didn't believe that you were at a funeral. <laughs> What type of woman doesn't believe you when you tell her that somebody died and you gotta go to their funeral? And the crazy part is you really weren't going to a funeral. So now you gotta pull up to a random funeral home on your way to the club so you can take a picture about a corpse and save your relationship. Y'all wasn't dealing with that back then. And the issue is millennials, we put a lot of pressure on the people we date. That's why nobody's selling it now. We expect a lot from our partners. I read an article the other day that said that the number one turnoff for women right now is men with bad grammar. <laughs> Which goes to show you how much more sophisticated women are than men. <laughs> the fact that you wouldn't sleep with a guy because he has bad grammar. <laughs> That'd be like a guy <laughs> not having sex with a girl <laughs> because she has... <laughs> um... I can't even think of a real reason not to sleep with somebody. <laughs> Guys don't care about grammar. I asked one of my boys, I was like, yo, you care about a woman's grammar? He was like, what do you mean? Like her period? I was like, never mind. <laughs> Guys, I mean like. <laughs> uh, that's, a good, that's a good way to get out of it, man. That's great. <laughs> I Thank love those you, videos man. where you're cracking up that piano guy over there and he's just losing it. That's like the best. <laughs> yeah, that's funny because normally I try to, you know, you try to, I kind of try to remain, you, you try not to break character. <laughs> but at the cellar, the, those guys are, first of all, they're like so talented, but like sometimes they could be so serious, like the whole time you're doing, yeah. they're just so serious. But like, it's tough to continue when he's dying laughing, yeah, like, yeah. And, and the thing, like, so, so that just, I just miss that place so much. Oh, for sure. That's what I, I went up, I guess in 2019, I went to New York for uh, about a week or so and just lived. Got yeah. the cellar and the pussycat and all that stuff. Yeah. Just what a, like, People, I mean, living in Houston, it's insane. You go sit in there for a few nights and you see every headliner that you would have to pay 50 bucks a ticket to see around the nation. And you yeah. just see them boom, 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 yeah. boom on stage. Yeah. You're like, this is, yeah. it's an incredible town. And I've always said this, like, even before I was a regular there, I always said, like, the dope part about a place like that is almost not necessarily those headliners because a lot of times you see those headliners and they know that they that you got to pay fifty dollars a ticket to see them, so they're not giving you the fifty dollars show mm -hmm. that they would give because they know that you know they're they're using it differently. It's yeah. the young hungry comics that you see at the cellar, like those guys that you watch and you're like, how is this guy not like a guy? <laughs> like those guys that are next up that you see them that they they don't charge fifty dollars a ticket, so every show they're bringing it like those are like the the real I, I think the real like amazing one like i remember i remember first starting in comedy like in 2011 2012 and i went to the cellar on a date and i saw ali wong before like anybody 
nobody knew who she was. Like nobody knew who she was. Even like when they introduced her, they were like literally like that's how they introduced her. They were like nobody knows who this girl is, but but she is a murderer. She's killer, whatever. She comes up and just blew the place apart, like destroyed. Still, still to this day, one of the hottest sets I've seen a comedian have at the Comedy Cellar. And you just leave. Well, and that night we had seen Attell, we had seen uh, Schultz, Godfrey, all of them, and they all killed. But you leave and you see somebody like Ali Wong, and you're just like, how is she not famous? And then a couple years later, she's like one of the biggest comics. Yeah, absolutely. So in that set, uh, I think you mentioned it, and Sean Patton was on. He was he also told us they they kind of prompt you with with things to to write about. Uh, yeah. Is that which uh, uh, I'm not going to try to guess. Was any in that set that we showed something that they that they prompted you to write? No, they 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 edited that 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 set is cut short. I did uh, I did uh, f- fifteen, I believe, and I think they took other jokes. They aired them in uh, on the thing, and they clipped those and put those clips up okay. on Instagram. Um, I forgot what I was doing. I, I forgot what was that. I think it was something about. Uh, I know I know they had they were done. It's so funny because at that point, that was like towards the end of the season. They were literally done with Corona. They were like, guys, we're done with Corona. No more jokes about <laughs> Corona. Like it's getting played out. It's old. We have too much of it. So like no more Corona jokes. I think it was election stuff there. I had a bit about uh, I think Bloomberg was running. The, uh-huh. Bloomberg had just started running. And I had wrote a bit about how I, I wanted to see Bloomberg uh, versus Trump. Um, in presidency, not because I was a fan, just because I felt like that was the epitome, like the the I, I was like that's the Mayweather Pacquiao of rich white men in their seventies, like at the <laughs> top of the two of the top billionaires fighting against each other, like that's must see TV, like that's the fight that everyone wanted to put together. I had like this bit about that. I think that's the one they took. Yeah. I love the way you weave the thread. So like in that in the dating portion of it, you weave this thread of of cameras and photos and, and like all the way through it with your taking your photo at the, you know, at the funeral. At the funeral and, yeah. and then the, and of course that two weeks, I mean, if you're, if you're at least 30 or something, yeah. you, you've lived that life and it just, like, you're like, Oh, that's right. Like, yeah. Photos weren't a thing. How did, how did that bit come to mind? Or like what parts came early and what parts kind of came late in the development there? Do you remember? Um, yeah, I mean, that's like, that's one of the things with, with like most, most of my bits, like I, I, I learned that from like the first Comedy Central thing that like one of the things that I was decent at was like, I was able to like walk people through things. Like, I don't know if you've ever heard the crew, the, the joke about me going on a cruise. Um, with my best oh, yeah. friend that's like yeah. one of the biggest like that, that, that joke really anchored the re- that joke is really the reason why my other set got so many views like that joke was the one that people were just like so much like hey hey that they they i did that they made me do it on bring the funny so much like i didn't want to do it i was done with it they were like no you got to do this joke but that's another story but um I, I i can walk people through it so i think that joke started i i reversed i reversed uh engineered it um and and there's a there's a part that they that they that is cut out from there too. I think I didn't do it that night. I think I was running short on time, so I didn't do it that night. But the joke started with um uh old people giving me advice, like and I'm like, you never had to go through what young men gotta go through in modern dating. Like you never had to video chat with your girlfriend at a funeral. Like that was it. Like I had that. And then I and I added the tag and then I was like, and the crazy part is you really weren't even going to a funeral. You just started going <laughs> to a club. So now you got to pull up to a random yeah. funeral home in the middle of the thing. And then I started going backwards. I was like, but wait, but, but then I was like, but, but what was it like? Like in my, I was like, what was it like for older guys dating? And then I was like, mm. it was great for them. You could just do whatever you want. Like that, that, like that's the, 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 Real bitch, like you could do you. It's like you remember when your parents were dating. You could do whatever you want. You could just be married, have another family right across town, just raise two families in the same school district. It was like nobody <laughs> knew. It was no proof. I was like, there's no proof. Even if you got caught, at, then I did that. Even if you got caught red-handed, somebody had a camera on them. They took a hit picture of you in the middle of the club, flash went off in the middle <laughs> of the club. You wouldn't even be worried because you had two weeks before that <laughs> even got developed. You wouldn't even leave the club. You'd be like, I got time. <laughs> They're not gonna, you know, that's not a thing. And then I had another thing. I, I, this is the part that they, they, I didn't do that thing. Then I added, I had that. Then I added another part. I was like, um, I was like, this is how easy dating was back in the day. Like, this is how easy. Like, you literally could come home late your wife would be waiting up for you. She'd be like, where were you when you got home? Back then, you could just lie comfortably. You could lie. You knew she didn't have proof. You could be like, I was out late working, and she'd just have to believe you. 
I was like, but sometimes she'd have proof. She'd have a person to call her and be like, I saw him out at the club with so-and-so. And I would be like, back in the day, that's how easy it was to get out of that. You could literally just say this. You ready? You could say, because I, I said she could have a friend that called her. Like, hey, Jennifer called me and told me you were out with another person. And I was like, you could get out of it by saying this. Are you ready? You could say, Jennifer is a liar. And then, <laughs> and then you could just, just go about your day. She'd be like, all right, I guess I don't have a comeback for that. I guess Jennifer is a liar. So that was like the whole bit. Again, like reverse, like reverse, had the punchline. I knew that funeral joke had a punchline, but I'm trying to add Mm-hmm. You know, because the if if the build up, you see how long that build up is to like the funeral. I feel like if the build up keeps getting bigger, it'll make the last laugh even bigger. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just trying to add, trying to La- add. Last laugh is perfect way to put it. So we're gonna wrap, man. But before we do, one of the things that we like to do is do our segment called Last Laugh. This is really creepy. Stand with us for one second. I hate. I get- it's it creepier every time. Yeah, yeah. So, so the idea is Ian that you uh, you've got one joke that you can put on your tombstone. It could be yours or some somebody you love, like Ali Wong or some, but uh, that you'd be remembered by. So, what, what would your last laugh be? Uh, I, I'll use this joke because um, again, this is like one of my like uh, favorite comedians and and influencers, especially his early stuff, which is uh, Hannibal. I, and and, uh, and my name is Hannibal. He got a joke that I thought was because I try to like again. Even though I, I, I talk about quote unquote borderline seriously topics, I try to remain as silly as I can. Hence, like the at a funeral taking a picture with a dead body. Like I try to remain silly. He has this joke where he's like, uh, I don't want to butcher it, but it goes. He's like, he's like the other day I was leaving a CVS and I had a bag of Oreos and Chips Ahoy. I had a, a, a two bags of Oreos and Chips Ahoy in my hand. Some homeless guy came up to me and said, Hey, it's my birthday. And he's like, That's the only time with no sarcasm. I, I could reply to him, what, you want a cookie or something? (laughs) It's such a simple joke. It's so silly, but it's so funny. Like, I remember hearing that and I'm like, that's so, that is such a funny joke. Like, I I, I really enjoy that joke. What, you want a cookie or something on the, on the tombstone? (laughs) Yeah, that's, I like it. uh, Yeah. Before I go, who are some of your guys' favorite comics? Just, just wondering. I'm a Louis guy, Louis CK. So the, a lot of my stuff gets on the darker side and it's of yeah. course hard to admit that these days, but yeah, you know, yeah. uh, yeah. that that's definitely my background. And then Eddie Murphy was the first one that was like, you know, yeah. old, he was rock star though. That he wasn't one that like, when you see Eddie, you're like, I can't do this. That's only for rock stars, you know? Right, 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 right. Yeah. And then I started seeing things like last comic standing. And we've had a lot of those guys who participate in that. And that's like, Oh yeah. shit, anybody can really do this if you want to put the work in. So right. Louis and, and Eddie were my two big ones. Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm all into like Mitch Hedberg and Norm McDonald. Those were like I was gonna say Norm. Norm is probably like top three, top five for me because I I just love I love you know you have like Chappelle is probably my favorite. You have your comedians that are like you know social commentary and they do that's what they do. They they try to address what's going on in society. But I love a comic who's talking about nothing. And it's yeah. just funny, like Norman, Norm, Norman, yeah. Norm McDonald, I love him too, but Norm McDonald, he's just talking like about, like, if you watch his set, you're like, what? <laughs> like, yeah. like, how do you even come up with this stuff? It's, I love him. He's, yeah. he's even got this, I don't know if you saw this crazy TV show on Hulu called Mike yeah. Tyson Mysteries. Oh, no, no, I didn't see, I saw his Netflix one. I thought you were going to bring up his oh, Netflix. He's got the, he's on this cartoon. It's really Michael, Michael, Mike Tyson. Yeah, doing the voice, and it's like a it's like a TV show that's kind of like um what do you uh, what's the old uh crap Scooby Doo yeah mysteries, but it's Mike Tyson and Norm Macdonald is a character in that show. He's a little pigeon, and yeah. it's just like I think they just let him write his own lines. It's so good. He yeah, just it's, does, yeah, it's so good. I know we're wrapping up, but one I'll say one last thing. You know, you know how like sometimes we all have bits and then you see people that come up to you and they'll be like, is that true? Did that really happen? As if as if if, if it really happened, it makes it like better to me. Right. I'm like the complete opposite. I'm like, who cares if it really happened? If that didn't happen and you had the mentality to come up with that, like I'm way more impressed by that. Like it's easy to retell a story that happened. But like if you completely created this out of nowhere, mm-hmm. like that is talent to me. Like that that's how, how I look at it. Well, it's interesting you should say that because we actually interviewed Sam Talent and he yeah. says he's totally in that headspace where he's like, most of my bits totally made up. Where I feel like 
I would say the majority of comics at least have a kernel of truth in there. Sam was like, no, I just come up. I just work. I just create stuff and go with it. I don't care about making it connect to a true story. He just writes it. Yeah, that's like that's that's like real tough. That's like a cre- like you're creating. It's like you're writing movies. You're writing, mm-hmm. you, you, you know, and I think comics, we exaggerate on how, you know, how truth that little kernel is. We're like, well, it didn't really happen. I saw it once on TV <laughs> and, and, and I kind of felt like it happened to me. You know, you can how- imagine what it'd be like, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to pop up the graphic real quick. I think I'm doing this right. Oh, shoot. They blocked this out. But Entre Nos LA Meets New York. It's on HBO Max. So yeah. get your subscription or get your trial subscription just to catch this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just watch it, man. It's fun. It's quick. You know, I, I have 15 minutes. You don't have to, you know, sometimes our specials could be like, you know, it, it's it's tough to sit through. We don't have that attention span. This is quick. Jokes come, come at you fast and you'll be, you know, check it out. How can we find you on the, online and all the places? What what people need to know about you and where to find you? Yeah, right there, Ian Lara Live. It's me, Ian Lara Live on Instagram, Ian Lara Live on Twitter. And if you search Ian Lara on YouTube, you can get my Tonight Show set, all my Comedy Central sets, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's it. That's awesome, dude. Thank you so much for the time today. You've been so generous with with sharing your story and your and your kind of your mentality about comedy. So really appreciate your time today. Thank you, man. Thank you guys for for uh, having me. I really appreciate it. This is all I got for the rest of the year. So uh, thank you. <laughs> we'll have you back. We'll just every week. You want to just be the new the third host on this show? <laughs> right. This is it, man. Very thank good. You, man. Well, well, thank you for joining us, and uh, make sure you guys join us next week with Joy Joyelle Nicole Johnson. I'm Joyelle. Yeah, she's great. So uh, this has been breaking down bits. Thanks for listening to Breaking Down Bits. You can keep in touch or get more when you follow at Breaking Down Bits on social media. Visit the website BreakingDownBits.com or shoot us an email at BreakingDownBits at gmail.com.